Welcome everyone, this is Coaching in Session. My name is Michael Reardon and I will be your Mindset Coach today. And today we're gonna to be talking about meditation. Now meditation is one of those things that many people might say, ugh, meditation, I don't wanna meditate. I don't wanna waste time in my 24 hours to stop and be still and to learn how to control my mind. They would rather allow their mind to be complacent. They would rather allow their mind to be maybe docile or not flowing in the sense of just watching something mindlessly. So they are going to be stagnant. The thing about a stagnant mind is eventually it's going to rot. We can look at studies that have been linked with certain types of illnesses that if we're not allowing our mind to constantly flow, especially if genes and genetics are going to be involved, we might be more susceptible to these types of illnesses. But what would happen if we gave our mind a workout? Maybe the same way we give our body a workout. You know what would happen if you didn't move for, let's say, a year? All the muscles in your legs would be nothing. And the moment you try to walk, you might not be able to withstand what you know gravity is trying to do to your body. We have to look at the aspect of our body is always going to be working, whether we know so or not. Our mind is always going to be thinking, whether we pay attention or whether we don't. What if we start to be more mindful of how our mind was thinking? What would happen if we had control over our mind and we did the things that would benefit us each and every day? Would we get somewhere in life? Would we make some changes to grow as an individual, as a person? get to the places that maybe we were destined to be or the places that we want to be. Meditation can be that key to that locked door that you're facing right now. And you might have a bunch of problems, a plethora of issues in your life. And you might think that there is no quick fix to it, but there is a start. So today we're going to be looking how meditation can help jumpstart to a better day a better week, a better month, a better year, a better life. And we're not going to be doing it alone. We're going to be doing it with my guest, Ann Swanson. Welcome, Ann Swanson, to Coaching and Session. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? Doing well. Thanks so much for coming on today. I'm going to have you on as an author and a meditation teacher. In our busy world today, meditation is one of those things that many people they would like to do, maybe they think about doing, maybe they have tried and have failed miserably. I know when I started to do meditation, it was very difficult, but the more you do it, the better you get. And today we're going to be talking about how meditation can help a person's mind, mindset, and help them in the real world. In your own words, can you tell the world who you are, what you do, and how you help? Well, my name is Ann Swanson, and I am now a meditation teacher and yoga therapist, but meditation did not come easy to me. It was actually not natural. I'm a very like type A perfectionist, mind wandering, creative type of person. And I didn't even really come to meditation. I came to yoga first and mind body practices. And then by the time we'd get to the meditation portion of the class, I'd be looking at my watch like it is time to go. This is a waste of time. I have things to do. And so it took me a while to really warm to it. And now I know this is really where the magic happens, but also there's so much science to support it. For my recent book, Meditation for the Real World, I teamed with Harvard neuroscientist, Dr. Sarah Lazar to integrate the most cutting edge neuroscience and research to support meditation. Because I think many of us by now know what's good for us, but like, do we really know how and why in order to motivate us to do it? And then incorporating step-by-step practices that you will actually do in the real world. It's not like you have to be 20 minutes on a cushion on the floor in perfect silence. You can meditate while you wait rather than scrolling while you wait on the subway, on a bus, uh, waiting when you're picking up your kids from school. You can integrate it into these moments into your life. So that's really what I'm all about right now. It's making it practical and accessible. I started, let me think, did I start meditation before I did yoga? Maybe, I think a little bit. I think I started to get into meditation. And then when I went to do yoga, I like Bikram yoga because it's more challenging. I did regular yoga too. It's fine, but Bikram yoga was a challenge for me. And the thing I loved most about Bikram was not about being in the hot room, which is a big challenge, but it was every day, no matter what, your body was different. Your mind was different. 
Some days you could do the poses very easily. Some days you would struggle doing the poses. And one of the things that I struggled with early on was I was upset with myself that I couldn't do what I did the day before, the week before, the month before. And I wasn't giving myself any awareness. I wasn't being, I guess you can say fair to myself because maybe I didn't eat right. Maybe I didn't sleep right. I wasn't looking at all the different factors that would help me have a good class until I said, wait, let me look at all the aspects. And many people, they fail to look at all the aspects of life. How do you start to help individuals pay attention to those small little things that can add up to the big things later on? Yeah, I find, you know, in this modern world, we can be so competitive, even if it's with yourself, like you described. But the answer is self-compassion and understanding that the only thing that doesn't change is the fact that everything changes. So a lot of us have a smartwatch or something that keeps track of things like our heart rate, our sleep, our heart rate variability. And we see those things change through the month based off of what we ate, what we drank. These things all fluctuate. So you can fluctuate your yoga practice or your meditation practice to meet that. And that's really why I'm a yoga therapist, right? I, I got a master's of science in yoga therapy to be able to adapt these practices therapeutically for people because it's not one size fits all. It's not like one practice, one meditation, everybody's going to click with. And that's what you need to do in all circumstances. If you're anxious, I would do a different yoga or meditation practice. And if you're really depressed, they'd be completely different. It's about adapting it for you and for what situation you're dealing with. It is difficult, though, because in the real world, things happen, right? Let's say you're driving to work, you get into a car accident, get a flat tire, something goes wrong. How can we start to give ourselves some awareness, some self-compassion in those moments when maybe we want to be a little bit angry? Well, it's okay to be a little angry, first of all. So that self-compassion of just that's part of the human experience. Our goal with meditation and yoga is not to be Zen all the time. It's actually to, to be able to ride the waves and fluctuations without resistance. The resistance causes the suffering, right? Pain is inevitable. Things that are challenging and difficult are going to come up in your life. But the suffering part is optional, right? Whether or not our mind says, this is not fair. Why does this always happen to me? And continues to perpetuate it. And that's what I think these practices really teach us. It's not about being perfectly zen all the time. It's not about stopping your thoughts either. That's a common misconception. I'm going to stop my thoughts and be fully at peace. Instead, it's about stopping believing your thoughts, right? Our thoughts are actually quite negative. We have a negativity bias in our brain for a reason, and that's to keep us safe. We have specific brain structures devoted to helping us stay safe, scanning the environment, constantly looking for threats. And evolutionarily speaking, that was very useful when a saber-toothed tiger was coming after you. But nowadays, we're having the same chemical cocktail release when we look at a stressful email. And you're not going to die, right? So stopping believing these catastrophizing thoughts that we all have, these sort of worries that, that continue on in cycles in our head. And you begin to observe them happening, and then you kind of step back and they slow down just on their own. So you're not trying to stop them and they will never stop completely. Even the most advanced of meditators, their minds will wander. You'll have difficult times in life. That's going to happen. You're just going to be able to ride the wave a little bit better. And in those moments, you know, you get a flat tire. You can integrate a one breath meditation. Take a nice, deep, slow breath. Feel your nervous system calm with an elongated exhale, which has immediate effects physiologically. And then approach the situation, right? I integrate these one breath meditations and these one minute meditations throughout the day when I notice these stressful situations, because the idea of just, just be mindful all the time, be present all the time, that's not realistic. We need to have these moments to reset. It's about the self-awareness, I believe too, because I'm very busy in my day and I try to do the things that are important to me. My family, it's important to me. My job, I like my job. I like my, you know, people I work with, right? But there are certain people, I call my phone and things like that. They're trying to take my peace away. <laughs> they're, you know, they're trying to make me feel like, oh, you know, I should feel bad or I should do this, whatever, right? There could be many people that act as anchors. They could be toxic in your life. 
And sometimes you could be in a situation like a bad job where you have a very, I guess you can say, not so nice boss that might make your life or your workday really difficult or just very difficult. How can we start to look at those moments when we have obligations to maybe go to work, provide for our family, and we feel almost stuck in this situation where we have to deal with a person or people that don't necessarily bring us peace or happiness? Yeah, this is perhaps a hard pill to swallow, but the answer is compassion. Compassion for yourself, but also compassion for that person. I do a lot of loving kindness meditation, which we can do in in that example right now. So you're going to send them compassion. This doesn't mean that you don't stand up for yourself. This doesn't mean that you don't quit that job eventually when the time is right, or you don't take the actions. But if you and your mind are cursing out that boss, oh, you're the worst, this is always happening, right? In your head, you're getting that chemical cocktail of stress. And you are drinking your own poison, that anger, that frustration, it's going to have physiological effects on you, your blood pressure goes up, your arteries become tighter, you are having negative health outcomes, maybe your sleep isn't as good. This is two part. One is sending them loving kindness, which we'll all think of somebody in our life right now that we're frustrated with not a 10 out of 10 frustration, but maybe a five out of 10, you know, It could even be somebody that like you were like in road rage, cut you off and on the way to work, right? So somebody at work that's kind of annoying you, not doing their share of work, Uh, a friend that has kind of not fulfilled their obligations. As I'm talking, think of somebody like that, okay? You're going to think of somebody and we're going to send them loving kindness in order to release those negative effects on ourselves. And then once again, you can take action, but from a place of peace and ease or inaction might be the answer. You're going to have more clarity afterwards where, you know what, maybe I can just let this go and deal with it later. (laughs) Or maybe it doesn't need to be dealt with. Maybe not answering that text message is the best course of action. And that's the way you're going to preserve your peace. Or maybe, you know, eventually in a few weeks, in a few months, you need to quit the job. So I still think action is an important thing if you need it. That's the thing people always get frustrated about this. They're like, well, I can't just live a passive life. No, that's not what this means. But as we visualize this person right now, notice how you feel. You might have some stories popping in your head about what happened. You might notice your heart pounds a little bit more, your chest gets a little tight, whatever happens to your breath, notice this for the next few moments. You're in a safe place. Just, Just notice what comes up when you let your mind wander about that person or that situation. And then begin to slow your breath and imagine them at ease. And repeat after me and in your head, you can just repeat silently. May they be safe. May they be healthy. May they be free from suffering. May they be at ease. Notice how that feels in your body to shift from those kind of negative thoughts about them to sending them good wishes. It can sometimes be hard, but notice how it still feels physically in your body. I'll even do a shortened version of this when somebody cuts me off or when you're in a social situation and somebody says something that's like awful, right? Just may they be safe. That's the easiest thing, right? We wish safety on everybody. May they be free from suffering because you know what? The reason they just said that nasty comment is probably because they're suffering. Hurt people hurt people, right? So you begin to develop a little compassion for them. Now that you're in this state of calm, maybe you say, that's not right. You can't say that to my friend. Maybe you say, you know, I'm not going to go to that event. That's not something that aligns with my values. Maybe you do nothing at all. Maybe an action is the right choice. But just saying that mentally in your head, even as you go through your day, you don't have to close your eyes and turn it into a formal meditation. You could say any of those wishes or make up your own. Send them good wishes for a moment and notice what happens. It's really, really profound. There's a reason these Buddhist practices have stood the test of time. You know, they work. It also goes back to like, we're in control of our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions. And when we can have power over those, then we can start to move our mind where it needs to go in a safe and an effective way. 
And I looked up my phone because I forgot the author and the book. I just read it probably last month. It's called Unlocked by George Mumford. And he works with sports like NBA. I don't think he does much work with like football stuff, but it's more of the NBA. And he's worked with some of the greatest, Kobe, Michael Jordan. I believe he worked with LeBron James. And he went to school for this, very similar to what you do. And he helps these players meditate, learn how to meditate, get into the zone is what he calls it. You're in the zone. And it's like almost like a flowing state. So I wanted to, you know, start to reference your book now and just talk about the neuroscience of meditation and the flow state it can cause us to be not only when we meditate, but throughout our day. Yeah, I love how you put that because meditation is a type of flow state. But ultimately, we all want to be in flow state. That's that psychological state that is of complete immersion where you're present, you're in the zone, you're getting the work done, you know, whether you're painting, playing guitar, doing a work project, writing a book, whatever your project may be, you are in it. We all want to get in that more often, right? We're more productive, we're happier, we're at ease. The work doesn't feel like work anymore. It just feels like fun. To get into flow state, we can practice flow state. And that's what meditation does for us. If you feel like, oh, my mind wanders too much to meditate. It's so irritating. Guess what? Meditation is boot camp for your focus. You're training your brain to be able to go into the present moment and notice when your mind wanders and come back. That's the key part because very critical neural networks are activated when we notice our mind is wandering. And then coming back to the present moment, we go into this central executive network activity, which is this high state of being very present and, and being like in flow state. We're practicing that. And if you do these, even as a one minute meditation, but you do a meditation right before your activity, you're going to notice you can get into flow state better. So I talk about in, that in the book, Meditation for the Real World. And I incorporate a lot of these short practices, like these one minute meditations you can do before doing a sport. For example, there's a section about sports. You name the situation, it's in there, right? Whether we're trying to do a work project and get into flow state, we're about to go do a sport. We really want to be present and part of that team. We're experiencing overwhelm from doom scrolling. There's a meditation for that or depression or anxiety. So you can kind of like flip through the book as a handbook to find which meditation technique you need in the moment and begin to practice it even as a very short practice of a few breaths, a few moments. There is a movie and a book called The Peaceful Warrior. I'm not sure if you ever read the book or uh, watched the movie, but there was a moment when one of the players on the gymnastics team got hurt as a male gymnastics team. He got hurt and then they were looking for replacements for the guy because if he's hurt, then they need someone on the team that can do his, I guess you can say, uh, his routine. So one of the guys, he only did the rings and he wasn't really good at anything else or he was okay at everything else. But his preference was the rings because he was good at it. And one day, you know, he was working with this mentor that was helping him focus on being in the moment, being present. And the individual, the uh, gymnast, his name is Dan, he used that, I guess you can say, moment of meditation before he got onto the rings or he got onto the horse. And he did great. And everyone was in shock. Like, what is this? Like, who are you? Like, he was a different person. And I want to bring this in. And this might be different than the book. But you know how like some people say, like, I'm bored. And like, like, if my kids are like ever told me they're bored, I'll look at them funny. I'm like, why are you bored? <laughs> there's, there's so much to do. And it's so weird. You know, adults can be bored because there's so much that you can do. There's, there's so much opportunity. Like I, I can't even tell you the last time I, I like I was bored, but I want to get into that too, because sometimes like meditation can be boring for people because they're doing nothing. And they have that, I guess you can say that connection of doing nothing with being bored. How can we start to reverse that for individuals? I, I think that they may have just been doing a type of meditation technique that was boring for them, right? There's so many different types. And what's become really popularized right now is, 
is mindfulness, you know, paying attention, for example, to your breath or your body sensations, which I don't find boring, but maybe somebody finds that boring. You know what? Those Olympic athletes or what you just described, I bet he did visualization before he went on and went. That's what Olympic athletes use in order to improve their performance. And it has been shown that if you visualize your sport, your activity, while just sitting there not moving at all, then you're going to improve your performance doing it. They've actually shown you can visualize going to the gym, doing the reps, and then they had people actually doing the reps and the people that were visualizing it gained muscle too. Not to say you shouldn't go to the gym, but you can gain muscle and flexibility just with visualizing because your brain sends that neural connectivity to the area, it sends those messages to the area and activates the muscles even in a slight way, it's, it's gonna make a difference. Visualization is a really profound and interesting one that somebody might want to try. And especially if they're trying to improve performance of, of a sport like that. But also, you know, there's over, there's hundreds of techniques. And in and, and meditation for the real world, I go over exactly 83 different techniques that's in the book. We say 75 plus on the cover, but it's 83 techniques. You just got to try and find one that feels right for you and for the situation you're in. So I'd say get back at it and try something different that will stimulate you that you'll find interesting. Some types of tech techniques don't work for me and you'll find the same. It doesn't mean you're bad at meditating. It just means you need to try something different and find what works for you. And so that's what the book is all about and a gift for your listeners. If they go to meditationfortherealworld.com, they can check out the book, but also I'm giving a five-day meditation challenge for free that incorporates different styles of meditation to give you a tasting less than 10 minutes a day. So head to meditationfortherealworld.com to get that tasting. Find what works for you. Yeah, and that's important to know what works for you. And it's not only about, because people, when they when it comes to like the mind, it's like second to everything else. I have to focus on what I eat first. I have to focus on what I wear. And then down the line, after we focus on everything else, I got to focus on how I think. When if you start to focus on how you think first, everything else begins to piece itself together. I like to plan. I'm a planner. Everything is, is structured. When I go on vacation and I do stuff, it's like, you know, pieces of the puzzle and all the puzzle pieces are literally just already about to be connected. And I just connect them when I do it. I don't necessarily have to worry about little things like what if and this is that because I already did the work. I already planned for it. And sometimes people, they have this YOLO mindset, especially with the newer generation. I want to get into that right now. The newer generation, they have a very different mindset. They want to retire early. They want to not work. They have a poor work ethic. They, they just want to be young and free. But that mindset continues on even when they're in their 30s and their 40s. They have the same mindset. And eventually, some will mature, some will grow up. But it takes that awareness, as we've been talking about, maybe some self-compassion to understand that life is going to be constantly flowing. And we have this very individualistic mindset. What is for me, right? I need to be happy. I, I need to be comfortable. It's me, 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 me. Is meditation about me or is it about us? It's about we. Uh, and when we look at the, the answer or uh, like yoga, for example, it is defined as union. And what is it union to? Union to yourself, un union to nature. We're part of nature, union with others. And meditation is a huge part of yoga. If we break down what is yoga, like at least four eighths, so one half of yoga is meditation. I would say even more than that, only one eighth is the physical poses of the whole practice of yoga. So meditation is about union. It's about feeling connected to nature and others. And as we just practice compassion, when you develop that compassion, it's not just about you now. You're able to from that place of clarity, now that you're back to your true nature, which is connection, you're able to act from a place of a place from your higher self. It's really about feeling more connected with others. And that's one thing that the researchers now are finding is the true meaning of life and, and, and perhaps, you know, the answer to happiness and the largest happiness research 
experiment ever at Harvard is over 80 years. The main thing that they saw helped people feel happier, live longer, was connection and community. Being in communion with others, having that sense of connection with your, whether it be your family or your chosen family, friends, you know, activities that you go to that that strengthen that connection. I think connection with others, connection with yourself, right? Uh, a lot of us have that that negativity bias. So we're trying to get over those negative self-talk that we have and feel really like connected with ourselves. And then ultimately connection with nature. One thing I really emphasize in meditation for the real world is how we can enhance our meditation practice using science, using science and other areas of research. We know that that nature is really good for our health. And we all know this intuitively when we go on a hike, you know, afterwards, we just feel better about our stressors in the world. But what we see in the research is that, you know, Japanese forest bathing, when you go on walks in the woods for long periods of time, it improves your immunity in ways that we can measure. We see that natural killer cells go up when we walk in the woods like that. And natural killer cells help you fight tumors and cancer better. And what the, the researchers think is that the aerosols from the trees and the air is actually healing for us. But we also see this with sounds of nature, whether you're in real life nature, walking in the woods and you hear the sounds of the birds and the trees and the wind, or you just listen to recordings, which, you know, I use these sort of sounds that are science backed that we see in nature, pink noise and brown noise in the meditations in the meditation challenge at meditationfortherealworld.com. So that challenge incorporates sounds of nature and our brain doesn't know the difference from going in real nature and hearing the sounds. You start to feel the physiological effects from it. So listening to sounds of nature can really enhance your, your meditation practice. Even if sitting still isn't right for you, go on a walking meditation, whether it's a park near your work, or even a fountain has been shown those blue spaces and green spaces are good for your health. You hear the sound of water. You hear the sound of the birds in the trees. That's going to be really rejuvenating to take a five, 10 minute walk and do the walking meditation I discuss in the book. So, you know, there's many ways to meditate. And I think it's always going to bring us more in union and connection with ourselves, others, and nature. We talk about nature is nature similar to the spirit spirituality because i know many people are walking away from religion and starting to get more into the spiritual mindset i think nature is spirituality i think for me going on a walk in the woods going camping is a spiritual experience now the word spiritual is something everybody defines differently you know nobody can really agree on a definition but you know it's of the the world beyond the physical is ultimately when we break down the meaning of the word. It's, it's beyond, it's, it's this deeper feeling that we feel. And I feel this feeling when I'm just in nature. It's like a natural meditation and connection that I feel. For me, nature is my spirituality. Um, and for everyone, that might be a little different. Yeah, I definitely agree with that, though, because when we look at the wonder, you know, like when we look really at how plants grow, just the beauty, look at the sky. Like I was looking at the sky the other day and I was just like, wow, this is so pretty. And it's so funny because I come from Connecticut. We have a lot of trees, a lot of forests. I would go hiking all the time here in Texas, a little bit different. We have a lot of parks and stuff. And I live in the suburbs, not so much in the big city of Austin, but there's still a lot of green spaces where I take my kid, we go to the park, we do some walking. I always take the opportunity that's right in front of me, looking at the sky looking at the grass, feeling the grass, right? Walking barefoot. It sounds crazy, but it, it just helps me become more grounded because I could be stressed. I can be anxious all day long, worrying about everything. But then I say, you know what? I'm going to be fine. I already know I'm going to be fine. And I think people know that deep down that they are going to be okay. But sometimes they give themselves this mindset that they have to worry, but worrying doesn't necessarily bring about the solution. Does meditation get rid of some of the worrying that is in our mind and helps us focus more on the solution. It definitely helps with the worrying for me because I'm a, I'm a worry wart and type A perfectionist in recovery by nature. And, and it's been really helpful for me. 
to question that negativity bias, right? To not believe my thoughts. And now the anxiety and the worries, they're still there. They still come up, but they're in the backseat, not the driver's seat of my life. So it definitely helps with that. And I think from there, you do take action afterwards. Like you get clarity after you meditate. You know, I think the actual meditation itself, I'm not like, what am I going to do instead, right? Like I'm just allowing and being. And then afterwards is where you start to get that clarity. And you're like, okay, now I know what I need to do. Now that I've listened to my body, I know what my intuition, my body says. I think deep down our body has the answer to every single question. We just have to listen. And so many of us have numbed out and ignored and we're scared of listening to our body because of physical pain. I've dealt with physical pain since a teenager, you know, or anxiety shows up in the physical body too. And we just try to ignore it or we take a pill that covers it up. But if we listen to our body, the answers are there of what the right thing to do in every situation is. I love the aspect of that too, because, you know, we live on a very surface level world right now. Like everything just is, okay, let's figure out this and not the root. And meditation is going to help individuals get to that root problem, cause whatever is going on. And that is why I love meditation myself. And as we begin to wrap up, I love their conversation. I would love to get some final words from you and then for you to tell the audience where they can find you. Oh, final words. That's always like some pressure there. I think that the key thing is to truly like bring meditation into your life. It doesn't have to be this extra 20 minutes you do every morning to your morning routine. It can be that one minute before you click accept onto a Zoom meeting or somebody's late or you're waiting for the doctor's appointment. That's a great time to meditate. It doesn't have to be perfectly silent. You can integrate the these powerful pauses throughout your day to make a profound difference. You'll feel immediate effects and it'll change the way you think and feel and act in the world. Thinking of meditation as not being intimidating because if your mind wanders, that just means you're catching it. You're noticing it's wandering and that's a good thing. You're getting the reps in at the gym. You're building that neural network connectivity to be able to go into flow state more, to be able to be more present. And we also know another key to happiness is presence, being present. When our minds wander, we're less happy. Whether we're washing the dishes and our mind is wandering or we are having sex and our mind is wandering, it doesn't matter what you're doing, you're less happy if your mind is wandering. This is according to a very robust study published in the journal Science that we see with mind wandering. And so being able to be present more is going to help you be happier no matter what you're doing. My final thought is try out meditation for the real world. Head to meditationfortherealworld.com. You know, grab a copy of the book, join the challenge, order a copy for a friend so you have an accountability buddy for the challenge because that's going to really help you stay with it. It's a great gift book. It has beautiful illustrations done by a New York Times illustrator. It's a coffee table book. It's not like this heavy read. It's a flip through kind of handbook. So Check that out at meditationfortherealworld.com. Perfect. And I do encourage people to check this out because if meditation has not worked for you before 83 different methods, I mean, one of them has to work. All right. And like, I know many people think meditation is sitting on a cushion in a room with a bunch of people not talking. And that is one type of meditation. And some people find amazing breakthroughs in that type of meditation. But what works for you, right? Everyone is different. Everyone has a different mindset. Everyone is going to be in a different place. Some people in a good place, some people not so much in a good place. And whether you are in a good place or you're in a bad place right now, meditation is going to help you either get out or stay there or enhance it. And I encourage, like I said, you do want to check out meditation. It's not like you have to become a yogi or you have to become a Buddhist. This is a practice that is almost like eating healthy every single day. The mind craves what your body craves, right? You want to go to the gym, you want to work out, you want to do good, but your mind also wants good. In in our world today, from technology and all these things, a lot of negativity is going to weigh heavy on our mind. We need to find a way to bring meditation into our life and get our mind and our life back on track. So I want to thank you so much, Anne, for coming on, spending some time and talking about your work. 
All right, everyone. I'd like to thank you so much for watching that interview with my guest, Ann Swanson. What went on in that interview is that we were talking about all different dynamics of what meditation is. And meditation, again, is not so much of just sitting still. I love doing walking meditation. I also love doing sitting meditation. I used to be a big yogi. I would go to yoga, you know, two, three times a week. Now my schedule is a bit busier, but it doesn't mean that I don't continue my practice of meditation. And how I meditate might be different than how you meditate. I'm going to be focused on the moment, and I just love just being in the moment. You could be in the shower, you can be anywhere. Are you paying attention? Sometimes you're just thinking about every other little thing that you have to do. I have to pay the water bill, I have to pay the gas bill, I have to do this, I have to do that, I have to go grocery shopping. I mean, there's a lot of things, and most of my stuff in life is automated. Everything is automatic. There's very little things that need my attention because my attention, I understand, needs to be focused on the things that I should be doing, not the things that I can, you know, delegate, the things that I can automate. For some people, they just want to take everything. Oh, I got to focus on this. I have to worry about this. And people give themselves problems, not saying that they do it on purpose. Some people do, but sometimes it's just automatic. We have a problem. In a sense, our body is built on problems, built on that negativity. You know what happens when you get hungry? Well, cues in your brain and your belly might start rumbling, saying, hey, you're hungry. That's a problem. That's not like, oh, hey, I'm hungry. It's no problem. It's a problem for the body, right? Because sometimes when you're hungry, you're going to say, well, I can't think properly. I don't know what to think. You know, so you will literally sit on a sofa You would uh, lay down on the bed, just go through your phone. You're saying, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, trying to figure out what you want to eat. Very similar to what you would do if you were bored and you were just trying to watch a movie, but you spend an hour trying to figure out what movie you want to watch. What would happen if we gave ourselves a more clairvoyant way to thinking and living? We would be ahead of the pack. What separates the people who have uh, vast amounts of wealth and riches is that they understand their time is valuable. Yet, for the common folk, right, money is more valuable than time. They will spend all this time wasting, again, on the phones, whatever, doing whatever. They maybe give eight hours a day. Okay, now we have, what, 16 hours left. We're sleeping eight, so we have eight hours now, right? What are we doing truly with those eight hours? I just say eight kind of as a generality. You could have 12, you could have maybe 16 hours to do the things that you want to do. Our generations, you know, from from the past were more inclined to that hardworking nine to five mindset. But today our generations are more focused on, you know, remote working and being free and financially fit and being able to travel and work and to have flexibility. But the mind needs to be malleable and needs to be flexible. And sometimes we get caught up in the whole rigor moraine of what the world has told us. We have to be this. We have to do this. We have to exude this. And if we don't, something is wrong with us. But there's nothing wrong with you. Who are you? Do you know who you are? Some people don't even know who they are. How about, do you know what you want to do? Who do you want to be? Some people are so caught up in trying to please other people that they forget about building connection, being persistent in their day, applying consistency to the good things in life, not so much being consistent of going to McDonald's every day after work and coming home and sitting on the sofa. We don't need that type of consistency. Maybe we can go for a walk after work. Of course, maybe you're hungry. Maybe we figure out a meal prep situation, a meal thing going on where we can eat. And then we can go out for the walk after, or we can maybe for lunch, instead of, you know, sitting down in the cafeteria, we can go outside if it's a nice weather day. Heck, even if it's snowing, I remember one time, and this is a tangent, I remember one time I went hiking and it was snowing, and this is in Connecticut. I brought my little sterno fire thing that I made, and we went out, and I remember I had a sandwich packed and some water and things like that, some snacks. And I just went into the forest and I got off the trail and I went like into the forest part and just like the jungle was like the unbeaten path. 
I lit my little stove, got my sandwich, and I just relaxed. Snow was falling. I didn't have a tent or anything because I knew I wasn't going to stay there long. So I was just there to appreciate it. There was silence, right? The only thing you hear is like maybe the wind, some of the branches. I was able to look at what was going on in my life. I was able to focus on the things that might have been worrying me at the time. This is back in college, I believe. So, you know, college was a big, uh, you know, uh, hurdle for me, I guess you can say. Full-time, part-time job, plus 15 to 18 credits a semester. It's a lot of work, but I found a way through it. And the way I found a way through it is by focusing on what I needed, what my mind needed, and then creating the connections for how I'm going to do it. Because I could have easily been a passive person, a passive student, and not have give any attention to, you know, my life and my mind. But when I did it, I was able to create a flow, I guess you can say. Because after college, and when I became a teacher, there was like a huge amount of time that I gained from not having to work a full-time and a part-time job and then going to college. I didn't know what to do with my time, so I began to squander it. And then I said, wait, you know, something's going wrong. You know, my health and everything was starting to go kind of haywire. And I said, what is the difference? I was busy before. I am still doing most of the things that I did during the times that I had, but now I have more free time. What I decided was I needed to do more meditation. I needed to give myself more awareness and I needed to create more connections. It was not all about, hey, I have this obligation anymore. It was more, I have so much flexibility, I didn't know how to handle it. They say great power comes with great responsibility. And I had a lot of power because I had all this free time. Time is power. And yet many people, they allow that power to be you know, squandered or they relinquish that power in their day to a smartphone, to a television, to people who might not be the best fits for you at the moment. We can give awareness to everything in our life. And what happens typically after we do that is we get to make better progress toward the goals that we would like to have in our life or the goals that we would like to you know, reach and attain. It's not an easy task. Sometimes you need some help. Sometimes you need someone that's going to hold you accountable, someone that's going to guide you along the way. I wouldn't be here without my wonderful meditation and my yoga teachers because they help me. They help guide me through the toughest moments in my life. I can only imagine in the world that we're living today, how many tough moments individuals are going to be living in now and later. So we have to equip ourselves with the tools and the resources to help us get out on the better side. So meditation is going to be that start. And we do have to begin to give our mind an opportunity to meditate on the things that matter, to relinquish the things that don't matter. And the way we do it is with a teacher, is with a coach, is with someone who has done it, someone who has walked the walk and they can talk to talk. Because you don't want to be running around with everyone who's all busy on their smartphones and everyone's worrying because that's going to be you. They say that if you want to be broke, you hang around nine broke people, you're going to be the tent for whatever, right? It's something along those lines. And if you want to be rich and famous and successful and happy, you hang around people who are rich and famous and successful. What do we need to do? We need to focus. We need to pay attention to what is happening in our life and take back control of what we can. Our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions are going to be a great place to start. And meditation is going to be the vehicle that's going to help get you to where you need to be in life. My name is Michael Reardon. I'm a mindset coach. If you have any questions, email me coachingincession at gmail.com. And I will see everyone on the next episode of Coaching In Session. Until then, everyone take care.